Merve Alabak will defend the academic thesis, Let's Face Emotions, towards a more comprehensive understanding of emotional labor strategies. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you very much, dear Prorector. Now I'm going to share my screen. Dear Prorector, uh, dear committee members, dear supervisors, colleagues, family, friends, and audience, in the upcoming 15 minutes, I will give a summary of my dissertation. As you know, uh, due to COVID-19, uh, wearing a face mask is a part of routine life. Although it is annoying at times, it is required. This face masking requirement may be a way of making another serious point. In today's service-oriented economy, many employees face another uh, mask requirement, which is expressing certain emotions at work. Like physical labor, which is the physical things that we need to do, there is also emotional labor, uh, which is the work employees need to do to manage their emotions when interacting with their clients. This is called emotional labor. It may be less visible than physical labor, but this type of labor occurs where employees constantly manage their emotions as part of their job. Today, many jobs demand emotional labor. For example, flight attendants, uh, teachers, baristas, waitresses, uh, doctors, nur nurses, they all, deal with, um, they all deal with people, clients, uh, that are not necessarily treating them the nicest way, but they are still expected to be nice towards them. Uh, so it may sound easy to smile other people, but imagine yourself holding a smile for eight hours. Uh, so the question is, how do employees do that? Of course, the obvious way is to do that, uh, fake it until you make it. This is known as surface acting. It is uh, known as surface acting because it's all on your face. Uh, it's not really felt. Uh, for example, a flight attendant uh, has to say goodbye in a friendly way to every single passenger leaving a plane. So she can use surface acting to do that. Unfortunately, this strategy is not healthy for employees' well-being because employees feel exhausted. It's tiring to fake your emotions. And it may feel uh, inauthentic because they don't really reflect their true emotions. And at the end, they may look a little bit manipulative or deceptive towards to their customers. And they may have less rewarding interactions. They may have unsatisfying social interaction with their clients. Luckily, uh, employees have other approaches to do emotional labor. Another approach is called deep acting. In deep acting, uh, employees try to really feel the emotions that they want to show. Uh, now you might be wondering how they can achieve deep acting. Is this a single strategy or are we talking about different sub strategies in it? Uh, or you might be also wondering that is this all? Do employees only have two main strategies to deal with emotional labor demands, either surface acting or deep acting? These are all important questions. And although we have a very huge and rich emotional labor literature, uh, we still have a limited understanding on these critical aspects. And for example, we don't know the exact nature of deep acting. Is it a single strategy or is it a multidimensional strategy? We also don't know how deep acting uh, really impacts employee well-being. If there are multiple strategies in it, does it mean that these different multiple strategies are differently related to the employee well-being? And again, and we don't know much about other alternative strategies beyond deep acting and surface acting. Therefore, in my dissertation, uh, I focused on these limitations in the literature. And first, I, this dissertation aims to understand what does deep acting really involve? Is it multidimensional? And if, if it is a multidimensional strategy, then how the different types of deep acting are related to different employee outcomes? And at the end, uh, what are the emotional labor strategies beyond deep acting and surface acting? To address this uh, question, we conducted three empirical studies. In the first study, uh, we had a daily diary design. 
we ask our participants to keep diaries and uh, tell us what kind of depicting strategies they use throughout the day and how uh, they felt uh, during that working day. Did they feel uh, depleted? Did they feel authentic or inauthentic? And how rewarding, how, to what extent they had rewarding interaction with their clients? In, and their diary uh, approach allows researchers to track uh, participants in their natural environment. So we can learn more about the day-to-day -day, uh, emotional labor experiences of employees. In another study, we used a different approach, a uh, different methodological approach, and we had a lab experiment. In this study, we had a simulation, travel agency simulation, and we asked our participants to play a role of a travel agent and to help uh, customers book uh, holiday packages. And we had three different group of uh, participants. For each group, uh, they were told to use a particular depacking strategy. And at the end of the experiment, of course, we asked them, uh, how did they feel? Did they feel depleted? Did they feel uh, positive or negative while interacting with clients? Was it difficult? Uh, and in the final study, we did interviews with uh, employees from different occupations. We asked them about their emotional labor experiences. We asked them to describe any challenging situations that they uh, had with their clients, students, um, or patients, depending on their job. And how did we also asked them how did they manage uh, their emotions in such challenging situations. At the end, we had a very rich data describing uh, employees' different emotional labor strategies. Now I'm going to talk about results. In the first study, we found that indeed deep acting is not a single strategy. Uh, it involves several sub-strategies. First, employees can do perspective taking. Uh, that means they can try to understand what a uh, client is thinking about this situation. Uh, for example, an employee may think that, okay, maybe she has a bad day today, client. It's not about me. Uh, in positive reappraisal, it's also another deep acting strategy, uh, employees may focus on positive aspects of the situation. For example, she may think that, okay, this customer is challenging, but it's also an opportunity for me to improve my selling skills. And finally, employees may engage in attentional deployment. This strategy involves uh, distraction. Uh, employees can distract themselves from the negative aspects of the situation, and then they they can think about something positive and unrelated to the situation. For example, an employee may think that, okay, after interacting with this client, I will have a nice dinner with my friends. All these strategies help employees to feel emotions, like really positive emotions. To, and in this case, they can naturally show these positive emotions to their clients. Uh, but even that, uh, we are talking about different strategies. Of course, they have different consequences. They are differently related to the employee outcomes. For example, we found that uh, more perspective taking uh, is related to better rewarding, better interactions with clients. But it was not the case for positive reappraisal or attentional deployment. And then we found, uh, for example, positive when employees engage in positive reappraisal more than then they usually engaged, uh, felt depleted at the end of the day. But it was not the case for perspective taking or attentional deployment type of strategies. Again, we found that attentional deployment seems to be um, not the optimal way of deep acting because uh, when employees engage in deep, deep acting so often, they feel less authentic over time. In the second study, but it was not the case for two other strategies. In the second study, the experiment study we had, uh, we again confirmed that deep acting has uh, three different subcategories. Uh, in this strategy, employees fall in this uh, study, uh, our participants followed our instruction. But what we also noticed is that uh, they use different uh, emotional regulation strategies in addition to their assigned strategies. So it was difficult to compare the main effects of these three depacting strategies on outcomes. But still, we found interesting results. For example, we found that during the experimental task, participants who engage in more positive appraisal felt less depleted. But it was not the case for perspective taking and attentional deployment. 
And in the final study, uh, we, we showed that there are a variety of ways of emotional labor. Deep acting, once again, confirmed that it has uh, multiple subcategories. Uh, our participants told us they indeed engage in perspective taking, and they also engage in positive reappraisal. But they also shared with us a new strategy. It's called acceptance. Uh, it has been largely ignored in the emotional labor literature, but we know this uh, strategy from emotional regulation literature. For example, employees may try to accept uh, challenging situation being part of their job. Uh, as expected, we found also surface acting. Uh, and uh, the novelty of this uh, study is that we identified several different strategies that has been largely ignored in the emotional labor literature. Uh, given that emotional labor is very much interpersonal, it's not surprising that we identified by interpersonal strategies. For example, we found that um, employees in cognitive interpersonal strategies, employees try to change their client's perspective about the situation. Uh, for example, they can share new facts or different perspectives about the situation so that their clients will feel better. And by uh, managing their clients' perspective, their clients' emotions, at the end, employees themselves also feel better. Or they can also engage in effective interpersonal. Uh, in this case, they try to change their clients' emotions. So for example, um, they may try to make their clients feel special or important. Uh, and these two different types of interpersonal st strategies serve to manage both customer emotions and at the end, employees' own emotions. We also identified solution-oriented strategies. By uh, these strategies involve problem-solving tactics, by solving clients' uh, problem, uh, they feel better. And in contrast to this proactive approach, we also had a little bit passive approach. And employees sometimes wait and see how the situation develops without taking any action about it. And sometimes we, employees may prefer to avoid interaction with uh, clients, for example, if they already know that she's a root person, so they don't want to interact with this client. And we also identified deviance type of strategies. As employees may prefer to devi deviate from display rules, from organizational rules they have. In good faith strategies, they try to protect boundaries with the client and they ask the client to step back. And in bad faith strategies, uh, they intentionally decrease their quality of service. Because, for example, they stop smiling. These strategies help employees to gain power over the situation. And the biggest takeaway from my dissertation is that emotional labor is more than deep acting and surface acting. Employees had a very broad tools of emotional labor strategies. And deep acting is not a broad, is a broad construct, for example, and it has multiple strategies in it. And most importantly, different emotional labor strategies are differently related to employee outcomes. This result has, of course, uh, many implication for theory and practice in emotional labor. And uh, finally, I would recommend future research to go beyond the existing traditional understanding of emotional labor and adopt a more comprehensive and finer grained understanding in emotional labor. Thank you for your attention. Uh, now I would like to give the word back to dear prorector. And thank you for your presentation. Um, the opposition will be opened by Professor Hans uh, de Witte. Uh, Professor de Witte is Chair of Work Psychology at KU Leuven. Uh, please uh, ask your question, Professor de Witte. Thank you. So, <clears throat> dear candidate, uh, let me start with congratulations. I think you wrote a nicely written, well-developed PhD that is both innovative and creative, and it clearly adds to the literature in this field. Uh, the studies regarding the three broad uh, questions are nicely analyzed and reported, and they are integrated in a very convincing way. I do, however, have a question about uh, mainly chapter five, a chapter that I really liked, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You state that it reports two studies. Personally, I think that you in reality only did one study, as you only collected one data set. But the main question here is that it evokes two basic questions, and I'll 
tell you both, so stay with me, don't walk away. <laughs> <laughs> the first is uh, you ask experts to classify the various emotional labor strategy statements according to an already existing taxonomy. And I wondered whether that isn't a missed opportunity because by using this design, you probably restricted their frame of mind, which might have reduced the opportunity to find new dimensions. Uh, stated otherwise, why did you ask them to use an already existing classification rather than allowing them to classify the statements and to generate perhaps new dimensions? Uh, this design was perhaps somewhat restrictive and conservative and seems perhaps to contradict your wish to find something new. So that's the first part. Second part is afterwards, you ask non-experts to classify the same statements into categories. However, you use the same data again. Why didn't you collect new data for the second part of the study as that might have been much more convincing? And so my question basically is, does your design really match your ambition to generate something new here? Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much for your compliments and for your question. Uh, yes, the thing is, uh, first I would like to highlight the positive things on this design, uh, positive things of this design. Uh, the thing is, uh, by comparing experts and lay people perspective on emotional labor strategies, I think we had an opportunity to see the similarities and differences between experts' opinion and lay people's opinion. And also, uh, at the beginning, we wanted to make sure that uh, there are indeed uh, more strategies beyond theoretical understanding. It could be that, for example, these strategies that we identified, they may fall into uh, existing categories in emotional labor literature. So we wanted to make sure that like other experts also agree with us, these strategies are indeed uh, novel categories and that, that that has been largely ignored in the literature. So in the first step, we wanted to make sure that according to experts, these strategies are also not well captured in the literature. That's why we had this uh, step. And also I think uh, while designing this study, uh, I also look at, of course, emotion regulation literature, coping literature, the broader literature, to see how they, uh, what kind of design do, do they have uh, to understand broader strategies. And then I also found that they use kind of a similar uh, two steps because these two steps are different, but they are complementary to each other. Uh, and first, you, we make sure that yes, there are more than different surface acting, but we wanted to categorize them uh, without relying on the existing theoretical understanding. So it is the job of, of course, lay people because probably they have different understandings than scholars understand on emotional labor. I can imagine it would be so difficult for an expert to I'd categorize these emotional labor strategies uh, without really thinking about their theoretical and conceptual understanding in the topic. For example, as an emotional labor researcher, for example, I think it would be so difficult for me to categorize uh, these emotional labor strategies without really uh, relying on my existing knowledge. Uh, but for lay people, it is much easier because they have totally the probably, yeah, we cannot expect lay people to think about emotional labor as we think about it. So perhaps for them, it is easier. And also, I think it is also nice to use lay people uh, person data here, because they can also show us maybe within strategy dimensions that we never thought before. They could have novel insights beyond uh, scholars' insights. For example, we identified acceptance as a defect in category, but it is largely ignored. It is largely unexplored in emotional labor literature. There are some studies, although I acknowledge that. Um, and for example, we found that cognitive and effective dimension uh, and that is that dimension has been also observed in different bottom-up taxonomies in, for example, effect regulation, in interpersonal effect regulation. So that means this dimension has kind of meaningful or practical value for, for, sorry, for lay people. Maybe 
that means that it also has some maybe theoretical and practical benefits if lay people can differentiate effective versus cognitive strategies maybe we can train them on these dimensions because they can already recognize the difference between effective and cognitive dimensions uh, but as a follow-up study i agree with your point uh, we can try to validate our taxonomy with experts and uh, and maybe we can try to validate our taxonomy in uh, different contexts, for example, for employees who have negative display rules, they may have additional strategies to tell us. Uh, and with di in different countries, maybe. So my answer is that our design has some advantages, but in the future studies, it could have been improved. Maybe. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, and I, I think my time is too little to ask a second question. So perhaps I'll just give the floor to the others. Okay, thank you very much. It would have been a really short question and answer anyway. Maybe we have time um, at the Thanks end. Um, then I'll uh, move on and the opposition will be continued uh, by Professor uh, Yuri Hoffmanns, uh, Chair of Work and Organizational Psychology at the Free University of Brussels. Professor Hoffmanns. Thank you. Uh, dear candidates, first of all, I want to congratulate you with your thesis. I think it addresses an important topic. I, I very much like the granular approach you took to studying emotional labor strategies, the fact that you relied on daily diary, experimental, qualitative research, and the combination of inductive and deductive research. So uh, well done. And of course, I also have uh, questions for you. And um, the first one is about um, research on ego depletion. So in, in your chapter one, you list several mechanisms that relate to deep and surface acting to employee well-being and performance. And one of those mechanisms is uh, resource depletion. And then when reading your reasoning and when looking at the scales that you used, and I think it was the state self-control scale and also in the experiment, uh, the arithmetic problem styles, um, I could not help but thinking of the research on ego depletion and the current debate on uh, the lack of replicability surrounding the phenomenon. So um, my question is whether you think that the problems with the phenomenon of ego depletion, including those multi-lab studies that fail to support the effect, are problematic to your reasoning and whether they challenge your findings. So, so is the current debate relevant to your findings and the interpretation of these findings? Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question uh, and for your uh, nice words. Uh, I know that debate. Yes, you, you are right. Uh, it, it, there is a, a yeah. There has been a long debate about uh, whether can we really measure resources. What are the resources? And then emotional labor is really depleting. And if so, how can we make sure? Uh, but self-control perspective has been really influential in the emotional labor literature. Uh, and the idea is that like different emotional labor strategies have different consequences just because they have different impact on employees' resources. So that's the main uh, assumption in the literature. Uh, and while designing this study and in the writing of this uh, manuscript, uh, yes, uh, I have benefited from a uh, self-control perspective, ego depletion perspective. Uh, and uh, what I can see, say is that like surface acting is um, resource depleting because uh, when employees engage in surface acting, uh, they need to monitor their expressions all the time. And uh, so it is, of course, depleting at the end. And this is that's why we found, for example, several um, negative re negative relationship between self authenticity, which can be considered as a resource in, according to literature. And we found that uh, when we look at the result between the uh, self control scale, and again, surface acting was positively related to this uh, scale, and that means. Uh, at between and within person level, uh, when employees engage in surface acting, they, they are more likely to feel depleted. But for different deep acting strategies, it was not the case. Again, there is a discussion, of course. Uh, it could be that there are different uh, clashing mechanisms when employees engage in deep acting. So these different mechanisms may 
uh, rule out each other. And at the end, we can see some null, effect, null, null relationship between defectin and outcomes. But in our study, since we had uh, specific defectin strategies, we were able to observe the relationship between uh, different strategies and these outcomes. But we found, for example, perspective taking seems to be uh, resource enhancing because employees supported rewarding interaction, rewarding interactions for perspective taking. Uh, and for positive reappraisal, again, it is also acknowledged in the broad emotion regulation literature. Positive reappraisal might be an adaptive strategy, but it doesn't mean that this strategy is so easy to do. It is effortful, and that means it can be resource depleting. And then this is that's why at the within person level, we identified that when employees engage in more perspective taking than their average level of perspective taking, and they felt depleted. Uh, I think that's also a sign that this strategy is effortful, uh, in my opinion. And uh, for yeah, for attentional deployment, for example, we also found that um, it is not really uh, an optimal strategy. So because uh, it is also negatively related to self-authenticity. Uh, if I go back to this debate, uh, I still see, see that resource depletion uh, perspective is influential in the emotional labor literature because it helps us understand why some sort of strategies lead to these outcomes, but on the other hand, different strategies don't lead to these outcomes. So in my opinion, self-control view is at least still valuable to understand the mechanisms behind these relationships. Um, okay, so so would you would you say that the idea of um, like um, depletion still holds, but it's actually the combination with the way in which they tested this using those experimental designs that is flawed? Would this be your idea about the depletion? Uh, you Sorry, could you please repeat that? In my experiment, you mean? No, 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 not in your experiment. But, okay. and, and I think I agree with your take on this, but the, the, would, would you say that the, the idea of depletion and the idea that people get depleted from doing things that are very mm -hmm. intense uh, still holds, but that it's actually um, the, the combination in Baumeister's experiment, the combination with uh, a strict experiment that leads to failure of those ego depletion effects? Uh, so of course, for example, uh, we can have an additional experiment uh, in, our, uh, in my dissertation to make sure that like, uh, for example, if these employees, if these participants fail, the next uh, task that involves self-control. If we could observe that, that, that means, I think that would be very much in line with the uh, assumption of uh, ego depletion theory because they argue that in the following self-control task, if participants already depleted, they will not be successful. So, uh, but it, luckily in my experiment, indeed, we had this math test uh, to see that because it was also, yeah, it was very easy math, but the idea was that if you already feel depleted, you are not, you won't be able to even answer these uh, math questions in, in a short amount of time. This was the idea. So indeed, we found that for, for positive reappraisal, of course, the power was limited. I didn't have many participants, but still there was some correlation. And we found that positive reappraisal, for example, was uh, negatively related to this uh, depletion task. Uh, OK, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, the order of the opposition will be continued by Professor Angelique de Rijk, Chair of Work and Health at Maastricht University. Thank you. Dear candidates, um, well, also my congratulations to your interesting thesis. Um, also, in my opinion, it focused uh, to a very important and interesting topic and in the field of work and, and also in relation to health, its uh, emotions are very often uh, neglected. So I also learned a lot from your thesis. Um, and as has been said already, your thesis is a showcase of different um, interesting and innovative research methods, including a diary study and an experimental setting in a travel, uh, with a travel agency. It's about the implications of choosing these methods that I have, um, uh, that I would like to talk to you. And I have a, a question to you because um, 
it might be seen as a drawback that you cannot draw any conclusions on long-term effects um, on the development of common mental health disorders, on the development of uh, sickness absence uh, in the end. And it will not surprise that from a work and health perspective, I was, well, started to think about uh, that. And I uh, checked your thesis very carefully, but there is also hardly any discussion on the long-term effects while in the in the beginning in the introduction and second chapter you address uh, other research on long-term effects um so uh, i wondered um why you did not discuss this in the discussion and if you would um edit a part on on discussing this could you explain um first why you uh, did not focus on long-term effects and secondly um what what would you could you say a bit more and maybe raise some uh, formulate some hypotheses regarding the translation of your results to long term effects and what needs to be studied? Dear highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your nice words and for your question. Uh, yes, I agree with you. Emotional labor has indeed a long term impact on employees' well being, and this is. This needs to be addressed very well. I agree with you. Uh, as I acknowledge in the introduction, uh, especially surface acting is known as a very maladaptive uh, in short term and also in long term effects on employees' well being and health outcomes. Um, to, to be able to make sure uh, different emotional labor strategies are have different long term impacts, and we of course need to have a longitudinal design. Uh, and there are some uh, studies in the emotional labor literature at this. I can uh, answer your question based on their finding. And uh, what I can say is that um, surface acting seems to be a kind of a, always a predictor of health uh, over, a, over, the, over a long time. But uh, for deep acting, again, because these strategies didn't separate different deep acting strategies, they found a little bit mixed results. For example, in one longitudinal study, they found that uh, well-being of employees is a predictor. It comes first, then deep acting strategies comes later. But in another study, for example, they found that uh, no, deep, yeah, employee employees deep acting comes first, and over time, just because employees use deep acting, they feel better. Uh, of course, we need to do another longitudinal study with perhaps using specific strategies like perspective taking, positive representation, and attentional deployment. But uh, I can also tell about another research. Uh, uh, for example, um, yeah, my PhD supervisor, Dr. Hosager Research, she conducted a longitudinal study and she trained employees uh, deep acting strategies. And over time, uh, they were able to observe how these outcomes are developing and uh, they found that for example indeed employees after these trainings uh, employees uh, because they learn how to do deep acting it becomes so automatic for them even so like because when it is automatic it's also easier to do and it, that means your well-being will be better because you don't really feel effortful when you engage in emotional labor and from but from the broader emotional regulation literature, I can also tell you that there are a few research on positive reappraisal, and they found that, for example, in longitudinal design, over time, indeed, participants' well-being is getting much better than they trained for positive reappraisal. Mm -hmm. So all these things can tell me that uh, the main thing is that of again, different strategies are differently related to uh, employees. Mm -hmm. And and in your work, uh, the perspective taking was was so important to predict uh, as a predictor. Uh, do you expect that on the long run also? Um, you it, it might be well. We just dis you just discussed mm -hmm. uh, the um, depletion. It might deplete your resources uh, to um, to all the time imagine that you are in the in the in the shoes of someone else. Uh, so. Uh, what do you think about this uh, new uh, deep acting uh, strategy on the long run? I agree. I think, again, uh, unfortunately, due to correlational findings that we have, 
we always have different we can have different interpretations on these results. On the one hand, it could be really that uh, perspective taking leads to rewarding interactions with clients because clients uh, can um, appreciate their appreciate employees' efforts and because employee helps helps them. Uh, and they can try to reciprocate this positivity from employees. And but on the other hand, it could be that perspective taking are preferred with nice clients. Like maybe employees do perspective taking when they already know the clients. For example, familiar familiarity may play a role. Teachers they have the same group of students. It might be a lot easier to do perspective taking than you know the students. But come for us service employee, for example, they usually face different uh, profiles of clients and they may have uh, less opportunity to engage in perspective taking. So in my opinion, yeah, perspective taking, I still think it's a valuable tool because it's positively related to favorable outcomes. And this is also the case from other literature. Uh, but uh, to make sure about practical implications of perspective taking, we really need to have causal findings. And in the future, hopefully, we will see some causal findings about perspective taking and we can make sure about its impact. Yes, I, I, I agree. Well, thank you for your answer. I give the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you very much. And the opposition will be continued by Professor Simon de Jong, Chair of Organizational Behavior and Human Research Management at Maastricht University. Professor de Jong. Thank you, Pro-Rector. Uh, dear candidates, I agree with the prior compliments and so therefore also my congratulations on finishing this well done PhD on the interesting topic of when employees uh, take various acting strategies to engage in emotional labor. Uh, in my reading of your work, there are two key terms, acting and strategy. I and mean, we've seen this in the many questions and replies by your side that these two terms come about quite often. Now, my question revolves about the latter of these terms. Namely, I was wondering to what degree you really are studying strategies instead of, for instance, coping mechanisms, cognitive processes, or more habitual heuristics and so forth. I wondered about this because when I looked up uh, the concept of strategy in the dictionary, it states that a strategy is a careful plan or method for achieving a particular goal usually over a long period of time. And hence, my question is, to what extent do employees really design a priori long-term plans to deal with emotional labor and work towards a specific goal? Should, should, should such plans not include multiple deep acting uh, and multiple service acting strategies in, a, in a some kind of complex and strategic way? Or is emotional labor, as you view it, maybe a bit more organically and ad hoc? Reflecting on this, I thus wondered, should a fuller taxonomy of emotional labor uh, not include such more deliberate strategic level long-term plans versus more tactical level medium-term coping mechanisms to more operational level short-term behaviors? And if you agree with this, how could this then be done? Okay, and dear high esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your compliments and for your question. Uh, yeah, this is indeed a very critical question that I have been thinking about <laughs> while writing my manuscript, while designing my study. Uh, the idea is that uh, emotional labor means uh, efforts you show to comply with display rules. So uh, drawing from this definition, uh, we ask employees, what do you do to feel, to show the emotions that you need to show during the interviews? Of course, we were able to only capture um, deliberate conscious uh, strategies. So, yeah, because we ask their deliberate efforts. But I still think that our uh, new categories are very much in line with the new understanding in the emotional labor, and they can be considered as emotional labor strategies. For example, for interpersonal strategies, for cognitive and effective interpersonal strategies, I think we can draw from interpersonal emotional regulation literature. And for example, there is a, a 
Zaki and Williams paper about interpersonal emotion regulation, and they talk that interpersonal emotion regulation involves extrinsic, which means regulating other people's emotion, and intrinsic, which means regulating your emotion in the presence of, presence of other people. And uh, in our uh, study, we found that indeed, and they also acknowledged that in social situations, these extrinsic in, and in, in, intrinsic interpersonal strategies might be combined. It is really difficult to draw a line between them. And I think it is the case for emotional labor. Employees really use intrinsic and extrinsic interpersonal emotion regulation because their goal is to show the expected emotions and to comply with display rules. Their goal is to uh, satisfy customers and to give the best service possible. So uh, I can think of them as like strategies. And also, uh, I can also tell you this, uh, there is a recent paper in Journal of Organizational Behavior about, um, they, they talk about response dependent emotional labor. They say that so far we always assume that, yeah, employees simply follow display rules. Uh, but it, in reality, it's not the case. Employees indeed adjust their uh, effective displays uh, to customers' effective states. For example, an emotional labor is very much depending on customers' feedback. I think in my, my um, strategies in our bottom-up study, I think this is very much consistent with the findings of this recent study, because, for example, problem-solving strategies, solution-oriented strategies, effective uh, strategies, cognitive interpersonal strategies, I think they are all showing that employees uh, monitor their customers' effective states. For example, a customer is angry because there is a problem, and that's why they engage in maybe solution-oriented strategies. Uh, and at the end, their customer feel better, and they can also have their emotions regulated in my yeah i can also see that there are conceptual similarities for example for solution oriented strategies and problem solving coping uh, but again uh, i think yeah coping is a much broader term it also involves yeah, emotions and behavioral regulation but i think uh, these strategies are emotional labor strategies because employees goal is at the end to um, simply follow their organizational rules, ex their organization's expectations. And to be able to do that, sometimes they man manage their client's emotions. Sometimes they try to solve the problem at hand. And so, in, yeah, also I, I need to acknowledge that uh, they may have sometimes instrumental purposes. So I think, yeah. Uh, for example, we always assume that for hedonic reasons or for display rules reasons, employees regulate their emotions. But uh, for example, Devine's categories, it's a little bit in the gray area of emotional labor. I I'm aware of that. But these strategies have some regular benefits for employees. Uh, by breaking rules, they feel better. They feel maybe more autonomy uh, and they gain power over the situation. So I think overall we need to better understand what kind of goals employees have in em emotional labor setting. Is it all about display rules or do they have some instrumental goals or do they have some hedonic goals? Uh, if we, yes, understand their motivations behind their emotional labor strategies, we can see the complete picture, I guess. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Then we'll move on with the opposition to Dr. Caroline Matein, Associate Professor of Social Psychology at Maastricht University. Dr. Matein. Thank you, Pro-Rector. Um, dear candidate, I also want to compliment you with your uh, nice work uh, under difficult uh, circumstances. And I want to compliment you with the mix of methods and also with the beautiful design of your uh, your book, uh, very nice. And it seems to be you at the first, oh, you can't see it, but it, it looks like you at the first page so that you've <laughs> modeled here. Uh, very nice, uh, thank you. Um, and I received your, your book uh, a few weeks ago. And since then I have been chewing on it. Uh, so that means that you um, really have a very interesting topic. Um, 
And one of the things, because, because I'm, I'm, uh, I did some ego depletion research uh, myself, I was also in these lab studies, but I'm not going to ask you about that, but about related uh, work. And maybe you know it, uh, the work of Bru Brett Bushman uh, on anger management. Uh, are you familiar with uh, that work? Uh, it's not, doesn't matter if you're not. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar no, with no, that work. No, yeah. no problem at all, because I will explain the idea. Um, because for this deep acting, um, uh, the literature in your domain identifies three strategies, perspective taking, positive reappraisal and attentional deployment. And would you agree that attentional deployment is identified as the worst strategy or not the most optimal? Is that true? Based on my finding, yes, it is less optimal one. Okay. And that's very much in contrast with uh, quite influential work on anger management of Bushman. And what they do, they make people really angry. Uh, they say uh, very unfriendly things uh, to them. And then they um, uh, can show their anger. Uh, so be very authentic. And uh, for example, they can kick on the face of the person who insulted them and uh, which is glued to a boxing ball or they have to count to 10 to self-distract uh, themselves. And after that, they, um, they are asked how they feel, uh, the, the distraction or showing your anger, and they uh, do all kinds of tasks. And the people who distract themselves, so not hold back their anger, they do a lot better than those who, who vent their anger, who, who have this catharsis of showing uh, this, uh, uh, these feelings. How could that explain or how does, does that relate to, to your work and the work in your field um, uh, that attention or attentional deployment is one of the worst strategies? Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your uh, nice compliments and for your question. Um, I think I need to acknowledge here emotional regulation is uh, context specific. Although in my studies, we, we found that attentional deployment is not really ideal for emotional labor context because there is an interpersonal ongoing interaction. I think that's the main reason that we found uh, attentional deployment uh, related to less authenticity. Uh, but, for example, if you look at the broader emotion regulation literature, uh, attentional deployment is indeed for especially really intense situation it is recommended to use because uh, you cannot really uh, control over the situation you cannot have control over the situation and it's also so difficult to rephrase the situation in a different light so you can simply distract yourself to feel better this is indeed something recommended in the broader literature so i think uh, to have better understanding the impact of this attentional deployment we also need additional strategies uh, we, Especially for future research, I think emotional labor needs to adopt more dynamic approach and needs to address uh, the situational determinants of emotional labor strategies. It could be that, although I, I, in my studies we show that attention de deployment is not ideal, it might be that in some cases, in very highly intense, and you have a very rude customer, for example, it may work. And uh, so it could be the impact of emotional labor strategies may be context dependent. And uh, for example, you mentioned in, uh, in that field, in anger management, I think maybe their design was also not really interpersonal. Maybe this could be also a little bit different from emotional labor context. Uh, in, because in, in an interpersonal context, you need, of course, it is difficult to focus on uh, other person and at the same time think about something totally unrelated to situation. So I think that's why people at some point feel like they are faking, they are not really in the situation. Uh, so that's why I think it is not really a good strategy for emotional labor. Uh, but at, at the same time, uh, I need to acknowledge that sometimes we don't know yet for the emotional labor literature, but based on the emotion regulation literature, I can say that it may be helpful to get through the situation at some point. Uh, but yeah, of course, compared to positive reappraisal and perspective taking strategies, I think it, it should be less uh, preferred strategy overall. This is what I can say. 
Um, and I will also definitely look for this anger management literature to get more inspiration about how to implement these insights to emotional labor. Um, yeah, thank you for your very balanced answer. Or I think that's a very, yeah, um, yeah you're, 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 you're definitely he heading it. So something uh, there was sometimes a follow-up or the, the person that made you anger that you also had to interact later on with that uh, person and that the, those interactions were scored so, so uh, and then they saw those who were able to wait or distract themselves that those uh, interactions went smoother but I definitely agree that there are uh, it's not an ongoing uh, fast interaction as in uh, as the type of situations that you are studying but it might be might be inspirational um pro rector do I have time for another issue to discuss um, a, with a short candidate? a short question and a short answer absolutely okay I will try to a bit short. Um, it, it's more of an ethical question, uh, and I want to ask your opinion about that. I was wondering, um, the people who have to do the most emotional uh, labor are, for example, service employees at call centers. Um, mm -hmm. Those are not the best jobs. They are often underpaid. Um, uh, it's horrible work. If I think of myself, the only time that I have to do emo really emotional labor is during test inspections with students. That's only twice a year, and it makes me miserable. I, uh, it's those are the worst days uh, in the year. Uh, I think everybody uh, will recognize uh, this, and they do it every day. So I was wondering uh, what is good for the clients and the customer. They want authentic, perspective-taking uh, uh, customers. Um, uh, sorry, uh, employees and service employees maybe not that good for the employee who doesn't have to do it just once but all the time they have to interact with clients who were sometimes waiting for 20 minutes or half an hour uh, before they would be in contact this is getting a long question so a uh, candidate um your answer uh, what about the, the ethical considerations of demanding of employees to be authentic I agree with you, and indeed, but in the near future, I don't really see that positive display rules will disappear. So I think, yeah, they will be there because the idea is that uh, companies are benefiting from these smiling employees because uh, customers feel uh, appreciated, feel valued, and they can promote companies afterwards if they they are satisfied with employee service. Uh, but uh, or organization can still do something at least for their employees. They can really try to uh, make their employees feel valued and supported uh, by their maybe direct supervisors, for example, or by organization. Uh, usually this is the case that customer is always right. But uh, in reality, organizations can indeed take some steps uh, to ensure that they, they are in the side of their employees, I think. Uh, I have limited time to answer this question. Thank you very okay, maybe much. Maybe we can get back uh, on this later. Thank yes. you, candidate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to continue the opposition by uh, Dr. Shia Autewilligen, uh, Associate Professor of Work and Organizational Psychology at Maastricht University. Dr. Autewilligen. Thank you. Dear candidates, uh, dear Merve, uh, my congratulations with this beautiful dissertation. Uh, I appreciate how you very clearly explain your concept and your ideas. I really learned something from reading it. And I also particularly like that you did not take the existing framework uh, for granted, but instead critically evaluated the originally proposed strategies and proposed uh, additional ones. I therefore really also enjoyed uh, the bottom-up approach you took in chapter five. Um, but my question is about proposition number five, in which you propose a more dynamic view of emotional labor. Uh, I fully agree with you, uh, but I did not see this coming back uh, so explicitly in your dissertation. For instance, in chapter three, you use a diary design, but you seem to ask for the global use of different strategies during that day. Yet, if I imagine some of these situations, um, uh, I would imagine it with starting with a stressor, for instance, an angry customer. Um, 
but this may already dynamically change over time. So the customer might, after a smile, the anger might dissipate, dissipate or the customer might get angrier and angrier over time as the interaction uh, proceeds. Uh, and then the strategies may also dynamically change over time. The waiter may initially start with deep acting, but may revert to surface, act, surface acting when this does not remain a viable option. Uh, eventually maybe ignore the customer. So there might be all kind of dynamic processes uh, playing a role here. Now that could, for instance, imply that it's not so much the question which strategy is better, but more when each strategy is optimal to use. Uh, it may also imply that flexibly engaging in different strategies and adjusting them to the requirements of the situation might be an optimal approach. Uh, a possibility, possibility you slightly allude to in your dissertation with the poly regulation approach. So I therefore would like to invite you to take such a process perspective and explain what the theoretical implications would be and speculate what this also would imply for your findings, uh, for instance, regarding the differential effects of emotion uh, labor strategies. Dear esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your compliments and for your uh, question and insights. I totally agree with you. Indeed, for my uh, future research, I also would like to go into that direction to adapt a more dynamic approach of emotional labor. And uh, what I can say is that like, uh, the order of the strategies may play a role in it. For example, it could be that uh, Perspective, for example, employee may first try to distract uh, herself uh, from negativity in the situation, just and it gives them some time to reappraise the situation. So at the end, maybe uh, an employee feels better. But it could be that some employees, there might be also individual differences in these uh, dynamics. It could be that some employees uh, prefer to use multiple strategies, like in polyregulation approaches suggested. And also it could be that some strategies uh, are, const sorry, some people are constantly using the same strategies. Uh, and the question is again, uh, that we need to address, uh, should we look at the quality or quantity of these strategies? Uh, it could be that less strategies are okay because employees at the same time uh, use less resources to regulate their emotions, but it's, on the other hand, it could be also that uh, when they use multiple strategies, they can manage their emotions better. So these are definitely all important things. And also regarding the flexibility you mentioned, I agree with you. And we know, for example, from the broader literature, they suggest that indeed it is really important that people are flexibly uh, use emotional regulation strategies depending on the situation demands. And it is the most uh, healthy way. Uh, but we need more insight for the emotional labor and also in emotional labor, because the interaction is, of course, interpersonal, employees may change their uh, emotional labor strategies uh, to customers feedback, social feedback, as I said, for example, for these uh, strategies we have identified in the bottom up approach study. Uh, these effective interpersonal cognitive interpersonal, they, their success, I think, very much depend on the customer feedback. It could be that customer is okay with the cognitive interpersonal strategies. They can see the different perspective in the situation, but maybe some customers, they don't like it. They don't want to be challenged by the employee. They just want a solution in the situation. So these are all the important questions that we need to definitely address. Uh, and polar regulation perspective in the broader emotional regulations um, literature is a good starting point. We have many theoretical insights. And we need to better understand how this polyregulation works in the context of emotional labor, whether employees use different strategies at the same time, do they use them simultaneously in close seconds maybe? And is there any pattern of uh, the order of these strategies and how these patterns are related to employee outcomes? Thank you. <laughs> Then, do you have another question, uh, Dr. Uitervilligen, or? Um, I thought maybe Caroline Martijn wanted to finish on her question of the, uh, no, then shall I go on with my uh, other yes, question? Please. Yes, please. Uh, good, so in, in your final chapter, you come up with a number of new um, strategies, um, but I, I, I kept on wondering, based on the definition of emotional labor that you gave, 
whether these are actually really emotional labor strategies or whether they're more strategies that people use that might even avoid engaging in emotional labor, for instance, walking away or talking with colleagues, would you still call these emotional labor strategies if you stick to the definition or are they strategies people use to deal with an emotional situation but not necessarily emotional labor strategies? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that's a really a good discussion indeed. Uh, it is, I think, very much in the gray area. Uh, on the one hand, uh, they simply don't follow uh, display rules requirements. So they, yeah, the, as an, the idea of emotional labor, you need to follow display rules. But at the same time, these uh, strategies have some regulatory benefits. That's why employees do that. It could be that, for example, for avoidance, they avoid from a particular customer to be able to deal with uh, oh, the yes. customer better. Okay. Uh, Merva uh, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return. Thank you.
Merve Alabak, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality uh, of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking uh, into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Hülshager is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Professor Hülshager. Melvin, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I think you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Merva Alabak, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the supervisor affixed with the of supervisors affixed with the official seal of the university uh, shown by the beadle. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to um, Philip Verdine, um, who has a little speech for you. Thank you. Um, dear Merve, uh, congratulations. You are uh, officially a doctor now. And on behalf of Ute and Fred, I want to say that we are really happy for you. And we would like to thank you for your hard work and congratulate you on your uh, achievements. Now, today is obviously a very special day, uh, but I know you had some mixed feelings about your PhD defense. Uh, on the one hand, it is a moment to shine uh, in front not only of your colleagues, but also your family and friends. However, I know you were also a little bit nervous for today, and um, I am not sure whether you slept all that well last night, but uh, you can let go of the stress now. Uh, you successfully completed your PhD. Now, today is also the end of a long trajectory, and uh, I remember uh, the start very well. We were looking for a talented student to work on a project on emotional labor. We posted a vacancy and got uh, really many applications, but one applicant uh, stood up. There was a certain girl in Turkey who did not only obtain a master's degree in work in organizational psychology at a good university with really high grades, but she also already conducted research on emotional labor and even already published a paper as first author in an international journal. Moreover, one of your referees, I don't know, perhaps that person is present here today, wrote a very positive letter about you. So we were delighted, really, when you accepted our offer uh, to work with us in Maastricht. Now, when you arrived in Maastricht back in 2017 already, um, you were clearly very motivated. Um, but I think um, that there was also a little bit of a culture shock. Um, you were all of a sudden surrounded by a lot of Dutch people who tend to be very talkative and have a quite outspoken opinion about almost everything. Now, being from Belgium, uh, I hope I am allowed to say this about the Dutch. The Dutch say enough about Belgian people, so I feel entitled to say this. Uh, anyhow, it was a different environment compared to what you were used to, and probably also quite challenging for a more a rather introverted person uh, like yourself. Sometimes people had to push you a bit, to join lunch for other social events. And the fact that riding a bike was also not that easy for you at first did not help to go to social gatherings. I remember that soon after your, after your arrival, there was a PhD defense party outside of Maastricht and the other PhD students really had to push you to go there. But in the end, you enjoyed yourself. Um, however, you eventually, I think, uh, you found your place in the Netherlands. Uh, you made friends, found a partner, and you became a valued member of our team, uh, professionally, but also personally. Um, we are always looking forward to you bringing Turkish delights or other sweets. Right? As you know, my wife really likes the honey you always bring from, from your family. Um, when you come back from holidays, and I believe that uh, everybody in our department agrees that you are a very caring person um, who loves to help uh, others. You're very supportive for your thesis students, 
I dedicate a lot of time to them, sometimes too much time, I would say. Uh, you always help colleagues who need assistance in uh, grading papers, for example, and you generally help new colleagues to feel at home at Maastricht and in our department. But you are, of course, not only a nice person, you also did great work. Uh, you already published a paper in one of the best uh, journals in the field. And I am convinced that also the other chapters will eventually find their place and be published in, in good uh, outlets. During the past four years, you demonstrated your skills to conduct a wide range of different types of studies, you conducted literature reviews, interviews, cross-sectional studies, diary, longitudinal studies, experimental studies. So you really, and moreover, you also got familiar with the range of data analytic methods. So not only the traditional regression and ANOVA uh, recipes, but also more advanced techniques like multi-level analysis, clustering methods, uh, and so on. So really clearly over the, the years, uh, you have grown as a researcher. Now, during your PG trajectory, there were also some obstacles. And I guess this is typical for uh, any trajectory, but one, really stood out, uh, namely uh, our good friend COVID-19. Um, the pandemic had a major impact on one of your projects, and I realized this must have been very stressful uh, for you at times. But importantly, you were resilient and you kept on going. And I am really convinced that this trait will serve you well in your uh, future career. Uh, as your supervisors, we are happy that we will be able to witness your next career steps as you will continue working in our department. So uh, today is definitely not a goodbye, but a time to raise a glass and celebrate uh, this important event. And so let me con conclude by saying one last time, congratulations, Merit. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. Alabak, uh, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you with the honor you've acquired and I hereby declare this ceremony to be ended. Thank you.